Stars are big, and I mean really big. And generally, planets are much smaller. But what happens when you're too big to be a planet, but too small to be a star? Welcome to the strange and elusive world of brown dwarfs. Let's find out more. A star forms when a huge cloud of gas collapses in on itself under gravity. If they reach a critical density, hydrogen fusion begins. This bangs hydrogen atoms together under incredible force, and the result is an atom of helium and some energy. So this produces heat and visible light. And stars are a huge balancing act. Gravity is constantly pushing inwards, trying to crush the content out of existence. And the energy produced by nuclear fusion pushes the contents outwards. And this keeps the stars in an uneasy balance between collapse and explosion. Gas giant planets such as Jupiter form in a similar way when giant clouds of gas collapse under gravity. But in a gas giant planet, the cloud of gas isn't as big, and so their internal gravity isn't strong enough to squeeze the hydrogen atoms until they reach that critical density for fusion to begin, and a star to fall. Brown dwarfs are similar in a way to gas giant planets such as Jupiter, and are formed in the same way as such planets and indeed stars. They fall from collapsing clouds of gas. But let's go back and think about stars for a moment. All objects emit radiation. Cool objects emit this in the form of infrared radiation, which we can't see but we can detect as heat. But as objects get hotter and hotter, they start to emit radiation that is visible to our eyes. For instance, if you were to heat up a piece of metal, eventually it would start to emit visible light when it became red hot and if it became even hotter it would glow orange and then yellow and so on. Stars in a similar way are classified by their temperature and therefore their colour, from the hottest blue-white O-class stars down to the coolest M-class red stars. Red dwarfs are the coolest of stars, with surface temperatures between 2000 and 3600 Kelvin, that's about 1700 to 3300 degrees Celsius. So now back to brown dwarfs. A brown dwarf can range in mass from about 13 to 90 times the mass of the planet Jupiter. But they're all about the same size as Jupiter. This means that they're a lot more dense. They have a lot more matter in a space about the same size as Jupiter. And this makes them brown dwarfs. Even though they don't fuse hydrogen atoms, some brown dwarfs are able to fuse deuterium because the density needed to fuse deuterium is less than the density that you need for hydrogen. Deuterium is not as common as hydrogen though, and so over time as they use up the deuterium, brown dwarfs will get colder and colder. As always though, it's not quite as simple as that, there are actually different types of brown dwarf. And there are four different types of brown dwarf, I'm going to briefly look at each of them in turn. Firstly, there are the M-class brown dwarfs, I know I said a moment ago that M-class stars are red dwarfs, but here's where the line between a star and a brown dwarf becomes a little bit fuzzy. There's not a great deal of difference between the smallest red dwarf stars and the biggest brown dwarfs. These are also the hottest brown dwarfs, and these will glow red, but only faintly. And actually, one of the main reasons that brown dwarfs are so difficult to find is their faintness, and they were actually only seen and verified for the first time in 1995. Next we have the class L brown dwarfs, and again, there's some crossover here between brown dwarfs and the smallest and coolest stars. These again are cooler than class M brown dwarfs, and as a result shine only very dimly. The radiation they emit is mainly infrared, but also some visible red light. Their surface temperature is in the range of about 1000 to 1700 degrees Celsius. And next we come on to my favourite brown dwarf which is the T-class of brown dwarf. And these are cooler still, and have an atmosphere containing a large amount of methane. The methane actually absorbs much of the red and green light emitted by this brown dwarf, and as a result, even though they're only very dim, they do emit light that will probably look magenta to human eyes. Finally, a purple star. These are even cooler, with surface temperatures between 430 and 1030 degrees Celsius. And finally we have the coldest of all the brown dwarfs, and these are the Y-class dwarfs. 
Any radiation that these emit will only be in the infrared range, so will not emit visible light of their own. They will reflect light if they're close enough to a star. And actually, we found very few of these Y-class brown dwarfs. And again, the line between small brown dwarfs and very massive planets seems to get a little bit blurred. Since they don't emit light on their own, we're actually unable to observe them in visible wavelengths of light, so their actual colour is a subject of conjecture, by which I mean it's pretty much a guess. By which I mean I'm guessing here, to say the least. The temperature of these can be as low as a few hundred degrees down to body temperature. Even though this is cold in terms of stars, they're still hotter than the minus 145 degrees surface of Jupiter. As our powers of detection become more and more sophisticated and sensitive, we've discovered a lot of brown dwarfs in our local galactic neighbourhood. And since they're so difficult to detect, we've only recently started seeing them in large numbers. And it's believed that they form a not insignificant proportion of the dark matter that's out there, but that's difficult to detect. Even though they don't account for all of the missing matter, they do account for some of it, so hooray for brown dwarfs! I suppose the big question is, could brown dwarfs support life? Well, brown dwarfs could support planets orbiting them, so even though they couldn't support life themselves, their planets might do, though there is a problem here. Because brown dwarfs are so cool and dim, any planet orbiting it must be very close in order to receive enough light and heat. And this puts the planet in danger of being tidally locked. This means that the same face of the planet is always facing the brown dwarf. And this will cause massive temperature differences between the two sides of the planet. The side permanently facing the brown dwarf would heat up massively, boiling off any liquid water found there, effectively killing off any chances of life developing. The other main danger is, because the planet would be so close to the brown dwarf, any changes to the radiation emission by that brown dwarf would bathe the planet in lethal radiation quite easily. Life then around a brown dwarf looks improbable, but not impossible. To paraphrase slightly, the universe isn't just stranger than we imagine it is, it's stranger than we can imagine. Okay, it's time to leave brown dwarfs to gently glow in space and return back to Earth. Thank you for joining me on this journey, don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.